Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arun Wadvani from the Ingram Micro Cloud Sales Team. Today, uh, we're going to take you through an update on uh, the Cloud Elevate webinar series, and we've called it Secure Information with Microsoft 365. So you're here for myself, uh, where I'll give you an update and a quick overview on the Ingram Cloud Marketplace. Obviously, for people that haven't seen it before, and that's obviously where you go uh, after uh, you hear the great things today, and obviously how you place your orders. Today, we're going to be joined by our guest speaker, which is Rob Crane, who's a Microsoft MVP. We're going to hear from him first. He's going to go through uh, quite a few slides this afternoon, but hopefully uh, you're going to find it uh, of great value by listening in and then towards the end I'll, uh, I'll go through that overview I've mentioned around the cloud marketplace and there will reserve questions uh, towards the end of the session if time permits. Uh, feel free uh, obviously whilst uh, we're going through the content if you do have any questions just to pop those into the chat box function that's uh, there on your screens and uh, hopefully we'll get to those towards the end. Of course if we do and have time we'll go back to those individuals afterwards. So uh, just taking you into uh, the start of the session now, and I'll introduce you to Rob Crane. Okay, thanks, Arun. So let's make sure that we're kicking off here. So if I click, let's see what happens. And let's try again. Do, do, do. Okay. Let's see if we can get something else there. Okay, so let's kick off. There's a lot to cover. Um, hopefully, we'll give you a bit of an overview firstly on, on the security side, which hopefully everybody is uh, relatively familiar with. Um, and then we'll look at some of the specifics that we get with Office 365 and then some of the advantages and add-ons that Microsoft 365 gives us. So it should be obvious to everybody <clears throat> excuse me, today that uh, security is something that doesn't really have an endpoint. In this day and age, more people are getting into IT, more devices are connecting. So this is going to be something that's going to be ongoing for uh, quite a period of time. Now, that obviously is a challenge, but that's also a uh, revenue opportunity. Now, the other thing to remember here is that we can't just turn security on. Uh, a lot of it means that we need to adjust it for our users. We need to work out uh, exactly what level of protection they need, uh, where they're taking devices, which environments, uh, whether they're standing behind a desk or whether they're moving around mobile. So again, a lot of this is policy based. So that's where, again, consulting will come in to allow you to uh, focus um, that security on that individual client. So unfortunately, the, the downside with security is nobody's gonna ever call you and tell you everything is working and everything is secure. That's something that you'll need to monitor and maintain. That'll mean obviously uh, charging for the monitoring of that, also going back and making additional recommendations as different uh, facilities and resources become available. So one of the things about security is it's pretty much sight unseen. So you obviously need to spend the time to make sure that you educate your customers and let them know and show them the reports that they are being protected and obviously go back and revisit that on a regular basis. Now, from a user's point of view is they don't really want to about security, they just want things to work. So we need to balance up user productivity versus security. If we make things too secure or too difficult for them to use, they'll simply work around things and use, uh, use uh, technologies such as shadow IT to get around what you've set up. So again, it's a balancing act here to work out what works best in the environment. Now, security primarily is about reducing risk. We can't eliminate risk. All we can do is reduce it. So uh, one of the best ways to do that off the bat is to reduce the surface area of attack. So some of the standard things you should be looking at doing is turning off unneeded protocols. So if you're using Exchange mailboxes, all Exchange mailboxes by default have POP3 and IMAP enabled. It's very good practice. I would suggest to you to turn that off for mailboxes because that is really not required for most users and things like disabling or deleting users who are no longer inside the organization. So again, look at reducing risk by firstly determining what should be turned off or what should be disabled. And again, when we start turning security up a notch, we are going to get the complaints from users that they may have access denied. In reality, that's a good thing. That means that the security is working and you want your users coming to you saying, look, I can't get access to this. And then it's just a simple matter for you to enable that. So uh, another good example, again, is uh, forwarding rules in emails. These are on by default. So this allows users to create forwarding rules in their inbox. Best practice today probably is to disable that for the whole tenant to start off with and have users request 
that uh, forwarding rules are enabled on a one by one basis. So again, look at security as a firewall. The firewall basically has everything blocked initially. And then if you need to make uh, any changes, those adjustments are made, audited, tracked and logged. So again, IT security is the responsibility of the IT provider and it falls to the business to manage and maintain their own security. So this means you can't abdicate security. The user can't just offload it and never have to worry about it. One of the key ingredients with good security is uh, user training and user information. So a more informed user base is going to probably be your best defense against phishing scams and uh, security vulnerabilities. So again, take the time to include the users in this security environment. Let them know what's going on. Obviously, you don't uh, sell it on fear, but again, show them what good practice is, what bad practice is, and how they can go about improving the security of the business and making your job easier. Okay, so let's we go to the next slide. Yep, all right, so let's go down. So generally what we've got to remember is the easiest way is never the most secure. This means that Office 365, Microsoft 365 out of the box is probably not going to be as secure as you could make it. This means that you'll probably need to go in and tweak the settings to improve, to lock things down, uh, to implement additional policies. So uh, you should have a standard process, a checklist or a script that you run when you take on a client or spin up a new tenant that will make it more secure. And the way to look at security is that like insurance, it's always important to have it beforehand because the recovery process is always far more expensive. So when a user loses a device, it's much better if that device is under management where you can remotely wipe it or track it or what you need to do rather than having to take some of the other actions you may have to take um, in recovery. So again, this is the important thing to get across to the management, let them know that if there is a vulnerability or if there's a security incident, that it's gonna take a lot more time to generally clean up and cost uh, for them. So again, preventative measures are always uh, a good investment. So we need to, again, look at our own security situation. How secure have we got our information? Um, are the devices that we're using, our mobile phones, our iPads, our uh, laptops, are they encrypted at rest? Do they have BitLocker on them? Uh, do we have our information being secured correctly? Uh, if we need encrypted emails, have they been set up? So what's the situation today? Again, it's a balancing act, but the first thing to do is, again, evaluate the environment and determine what can easily, easily be turned on to make the environment more secure and then what can be turned off or disabled to make it more secure, and then we add our policies on top. Now, the most likely uh, entry point is going to be email, and generally what happens is once the user gets in or once a, a bad person gets in, they will then uh, use that to move them around the organisation, look to elevate their privileges, and basically they're going to sit in there and going to monitor the organization and look for other vulnerabilities or other, way, other ways to attack. So that initial entry is very, very important. And this is where it comes down to the more difficult you can make it on that initial entry, the more likely the attacker is, is to move on to the next target. So in this day and age, again, having some basic security in place is going to prevent probably a large majority of the incursions that we see but remember that the initial entry is always the important thing. How do they get in? And typically these days it's going to be email. How do we secure that? How do we prevent our users from uh, accidentally giving up their credentials? And if we do have a security incident, what action needs to be taken? Uh, what impact is it gonna have if we get something like CryptoLocker in that does spread across the organization, then <clears throat> what impact that's gonna have? Can people still work? How long does it take to recover their files? So again, some sort of analysis as to uh, what is the likely scenario in case of a security incident is important. So if a user's credentials are compromised, how long will it take for them to reset their password? What uh, will they have access to? Again, that's an important thing to look at and assess. And as I mentioned, assessment is a very, very important thing. It's not something that's done as a once off. It will be done on a continuing basis. <clears throat> It can be done with a lot of automated tools, but again, there's going to be new uh, entry points, new vectors, new ways of uh, gaining entry into the technology, and these we'll need to take advantage of and make sure that we are mitigating the risks there. So we're going to constantly need to be assessing our environment and 
the uh, users that are working with it, what they're using, how they're using, what devices they're using and so on to uh, help them minimise the risk. So probably, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the biggest challenges we've got in the security world is the fact that uh, when you are working to prevent uh, security incursions, you're going to have to sit there and defend against every single vulnerability. That means whether it's an email, desktop software, from USB drive, from devices, from malware, from all sorts of things. So on the other side of the equation, however, is that if anybody wants to get in, they only need to find a single exploit. So what this means is that the odds are very much stacked against uh, those trying to defend the environment. And that's why, again, it's impossible to remove risk. It's just a matter of being able to mitigate or to reduce that as best you can. And that can be done generally with some very standard practices. It's not going to eliminate it completely, but it's certainly going to make it much harder uh, and a less of a target for uh, the individual or the company. So again, remember that no matter what you say, what we see in the, in the press, it's always going to be a challenge when it comes to security and protecting users because now there are just so many opportunities for uh, attackers to uh, exploit vulnerabilities. Now, if we have to go and explain security to our uh, management, to our customers, we can do it very simply. We need to keep it as simple as possible to help them understand. Uh, this triangle gives people, I think, the best definition of um, security. The idea here is, is you can have two sides, you can't have all three. So the, uh, the way to explain it is, <clears throat> excuse me, is to let them know that they, if they have it, uh, a solution that is secure and cheap, uh, it isn't going to be usable. If they want usable and cheap, then it's probably not going to be secure. So again, what you need to do is speak to your uh, customers, speak to the management and help them understand that uh, security is a balancing act here. It's a matter of understanding, okay, where do we want to put our resources? Uh, what are we going to get back from that? So that triangle there hopefully should give you a, a simple way to go to them and say, look, you know, we need to pick two of these sides. Let us know which two uh, you want us to address and then we can craft a solution for that. Now, as I've mentioned, uh, the unfortunate thing about security is that um, in today's complex environment, lots of software, lots of options, lots of users, lots of locations, uh, we have a very complex environment that we need to, main need to maintain uh, the security of. So anything that we can do to reduce the complexity, to make it simpler, to make it repeatable, to make sure that we're applying the same policies across our organisations, the better it's going to be. We want to get things as standard as possible. We want to get it down to as few vendors or few different products as we can. And this is why I think Microsoft uh, solutions now provide a very good uh, way to reduce that complexity all by a single provider. You're going to get solutions from the desktop all the way uh, to things like email, SharePoint online, files and all that sort of stuff. So again, one of the big considerations in this environment today is that a lot of resellers have a lot of different security products. And it's just a matter of evaluating whether they still perform the tasks that are required and is there something else that you're already paying for or something else that is a smaller cost that will do a similar job or better? So again, one of the things we're looking at doing is to reduce our risk and the way we do that is to reduce the complexity of our environment. Now, you might have seen this slide before which will show you again a very typical style uh, of environments we see out there. We see a mixture of desktop operating systems all the way back to Windows 7. We see on-prem environments that include things like small business server. We've got a mismatch of PCs and devices, employees bringing their own devices. <clears throat> We've also got a range of different software solutions for managing, doing productivity. And again, this is a very complex environment. There are lots of vulnerabilities here. We have unsupported, out-of-date operating systems. Yes, they may still be in use, but as I said and earlier on, the fact that a uh, incident, a security incident is going to cost you far more than looking at upgrading these environments. So again, if you look at some of these, they are significantly out of date, they're very hard to support and they've got a lot of vulnerabilities that may or may not be patched anymore. So to improve the security, reduce our risk, we really need to make sure that our environment is as simple and as up to date as possible. So. The argument here is, is keeping things up to date, getting on the latest material. Yes, there is a once-off cost of doing that, 
but that's going to reduce your risk and your profile um, much greater than trying to uh, fix the results after a security vulnerability. Now, in today's age, not only do we have a monetary cost involved when there are security incidents, we are now aware that uh, there is a notifiable data breaches legislation in Australia. This basically requires companies to notify five people if their information is leaked outside the organisation and this can happen very easily. The most common, uh, I suppose the simplest way for this to happen is by a misdirected email. So we've all accidentally sent an e email to people that we didn't intend. So <clears throat> unfortunately, if that contains sensitive information, then the organisation would need to declare data breach and that can obviously have reputation damage, but also would need to be mitigated as well. So there'll be a cost for doing that. So again, the legislation applies to most organisations these days, especially around tax file number and Medicare number. Now, on top of the Australian legislation, we've also seen a growth in legislation uh, around the world from different locations um, like Europe. So for those of you who aren't familiar, GDPR is in place now. This is a European Union law that basically protects the rights of the information for European citizens. So if you are working with European citizens and you hold their data or your customers are, then they will fall under the GDPR requirements. Now, even if it doesn't, uh, if you don't have customers or yourself that fall under GDPR, I would strongly uh, indicate to you that this is probably going to become the standard that most other nations or organisations will look to adhere to. I've got a feeling that the GDPR in some way, shape or form will certainly become very standard across most uh, organisations and territories because again, it's much easier to copy what somebody else has done. So again, we need to make sure that we're protecting it for Australian laws, but we may also be subject to uh, international laws as well. Now, with this in mind, Microsoft has uh, released and updated their Microsoft 365 business product. That product is a combination of Office 365 business premium, uh, security, as well as device management and administration. Now, the items that you'll see here in red are the items that have been added since the end of April. So they have added a number of features to the Microsoft 365 business environment to make it uh, a, probably I would suggest the hero skew uh, for SMB. So we've added things like information rights management, we've added data loss prevention, which I'll talk about. We've added the ability to do mobile device management with the full Intune and we've got online archiving and we've also got the ability to do legal hold. So a lot of these features have now been rolled directly into Microsoft 365 business, as well as all the benefits we get with Office 365 as well. So in a little bit more detail here, you'll see that uh, these are the new features that have been added since the end of April. You will get these slides at the end of the presentation, so you can look at it in detail. But some of the things here you'll notice is the Office 365 advanced threat protection. This is a sandboxing technology that allows inbound information, typically from email, like attachments to be opened in virtual machines in Microsoft data centers to verify whether the attachments are malicious. We've also got the exploit guard, which is now integrated with the Windows Defender environment. We've got data loss prevention, which allows us a scanning technology to ensure that sensitive information isn't sent outside the organization like tax file number. We've got Azure Information Protection P1. So this allows us to put the permissions inside our documents. So the permissions travel with the document no matter where they're sent on the internet. We get the full version of Intune that allows us to manage uh, our devices, uh, iOS, Android, and Windows 10. We also get Exchange Online archiving. So what that means is, is by default, the business premium mailbox is 50 gig is the max, but with Exchange Online archiving, that effectively means that uh, the mailbox is now unlimited. So with Microsoft 365 Business, you're now getting an unlimited uh, capacity mailbox. And of course, we get BitLocker enforcement on our desktops. Now, the other thing you'll notice here, which is a big change for Microsoft 365 Business, is the ability now to support hybrid Active Directory deployment. So this means you're going to use Azure AD uh, Connect to synchronize your IDs up. It also means that you can look at doing uh, more integration if you wanted to around ADFS and Federation but this is definitely a new feature, a new capability that they've added. So it is now a supported feature of Microsoft 365 uh, business. 
Now, what we'll see here is that all of these products um, that are being provided by Microsoft 365 Business um, may replace some of third-party solutions you have out there. So if you have a mail hygiene service, again, it's something to look at and consider whether the advanced threat protection provided by Microsoft 365 Business is uh, able to uh, relieve that or able to take over that capacity if you desire. Again, the other question I has around this is, the, are the third party options that you are using, are they GDPR compliant, are they uh, notifiable data breach compliant? So again, all of these products uh, need to make sure they conform to the security requirements and having them from different vendors can make it a bit tough to do this. So that's why, again, strong consideration should be given to Microsoft 365 Business, which will roll all of these security features as well as the productivity features into a single solution for you. Now, as I said, you will get a copy of the slides afterwards. So uh, again, you can have a look at this table in detail, but you'll notice that the blue items in the list there are the items that have been added to Microsoft 365 Business. You'll see that there are um, also E3 and E5 SKUs for Microsoft 365, as well as the comparison there to uh, standard business premium. So for about $10 uh, more per user, you're going to get additional features like advanced threat protection, the mail hygiene, you're going to get a full version of Intune, you're going to get uh, unlimited uh, archiving of your mail, data loss prevention, information rights management, legal hold, e-discovery, compliance manager, and so on. So there's a lot of features being added in there. And that's why I certainly think that the Microsoft 365 business SKU is now the uh, hero SKU. Now, to really light up a lot of these features uh, in this environment, you need to be looking at uh, integrating the Microsoft 365 and Office 365 environment into devices, uh, modern devices. So modern devices are typically Windows 10 professional or better that are Azure AD joined. So the, get the most benefit from joining these devices, your Windows 10 devices to Azure AD. You'll get single sign-on, you'll get policies that you can push down those devices then uh, uh, then put under management. And again, you get far more of the uh, alerting, you get far more of the integration because again, we're all integrated into a single environment. And because they're integrated via the cloud, this means that they can be monitored and managed no matter where they are. And one of the big things is, is that these devices are always up to date. So we can control the policies, <clears throat> excuse me, in the back end using Intune and other tools to make sure that our operating system and our office and all those things are kept always up to date. Keeping software always up to date is certainly going to greatly reduce the risk uh, to the users. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, there are a number of standard offerings that come with Office 365 already out of the box, and these are included in Microsoft 365 uh, Business as well. But let's just run through a couple of these quick offerings just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So if you weren't aware, uh, basically all data in transit from Office 365 uh, is encrypted. So we've got things like SSL, we've got TLS, um, we've got data, to data center to data center encryption as well. And when the data is at rest inside Microsoft data centers, uh, it is encrypted in the databases it lives. It's encrypted encrypted with BitLocker and it is um, basically also uh, restricted access. So only a certain set of people can actually get physical access to the environment. So again, lots more information about this in some of the resources I'll give you at the end. Uh, lots of good videos that shows the length that Microsoft goes to, to protect information uh, inside its data centers. Now, of course, one of the most common ways or the best ways to prevent um, users being fished or basically having their credentials stolen, even if they do give them up, which they tend to do, is to implement multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication basically means the user logs in, they then receive a second code, whether it's a mobile from a mobile phone, a phone call or a text message, or they type in a code from an app on their device and that allows them to log in. So that means that if they give up their password in a phishing attack, uh, then the attacker won't still be able to get access because they need that two-factor authentication. Now, obviously, this is a little bit painful for users, a little bit extra work for them to go through, but it's fairly common these days to protect user information. Things like their banking credentials, government websites, all that generally have two-factor authentication. So certainly should be something that's encouraged and probably the easiest way for users is to use the push notification. So if you have the Microsoft 
Authenticator app on your device, you can set it up so that the uh, login process prompts the user, they just have to click on a button to approve the login, no PIN number required, and they're in. So one of the standard things you should be looking at doing across all organisations uh, to improve the security is certainly to set the uh, global administrators to have um, two-factor authentication, but also consider rolling it out seriously to all the users as well. Now, not only do we have two-factor authentication, we've also got other cool technologies in the Microsoft world like Windows Hello. So users don't like passwords, they don't work well with passwords, they uh, generate the same passwords or very similar passwords. So one of the ways to overcome that is to look at using Windows Hello for business. So this means that with a suitable camera on the device, you can look the machine will automatically log you in by recognizing your face. You can use other biometrics, you can use a companion device so that the device will only be unlocked while the mobile phone of the user is nearby. Uh, again, you can use uh, fingerprint and you can also use things like YubiKeys as well to protect it. So again, typically you'll need a Windows 10 environment to do this, but these other two factory environments make it much easier for users and maintains that security. One of the big things I certainly suggest and recommend for people is the uh, Windows Hello, the camera, the facial recognition. I found that to work really, really well and use that all the time uh, myself. So not only out of the box can we uh, do two-factor authentication with Office 365, we can also do some basic mobile device management. So things like conditional access, device management and selective wipe can be done <coughs> excuse me, out of the box with Office 365, but we're only going to be able to do a very, very basic set of these features. If you want to actually manage the applications on these devices, then we need to look at Intune. And again, remember this uh, Intune is something that we're going to get with Microsoft 365. So again, we'll get the basic management and then we can extend that with Microsoft 365 with a full version of Intune that allow us to manage not only the devices down to a very low level, but also the software that is on those devices as well. Now, if you, uh, if you aren't aware as yet, um, what you can also do, Microsoft has now rolled out the ability to restore your OneDrive. So what we've seen at times, obviously, is users who have synchronized information to their desktop being crypto lockered. That then means because it's synchronized technology, it synchronizes back to their OneDrive. And that means all the files in their OneDrive are also uh, unfortunately encrypted. Now, Microsoft has rolled out now the ability to restore your OneDrive. So a user can just go in, pick what date they wish to uh, go back to. They can pick the files they then uh, wish to uh, restore and that will then take those files back to uh, that time. Now, this is because uh, OneDrive has a version control. Microsoft has also committed to rolling this out for document libraries in Teams sites and Microsoft Teams. We should see that shortly. So that'll mean that if the files do get corrupted or do get uh, encrypted by malware, that you'll be able to go back, select a location, a point in time, and then roll those back uh, to that location to recover your files quickly and easily without the need to uh, call for uh, an administrator to do that for you. So again, that is available out of the box with uh, Office 365 today, and we should see that soon for uh, team sites and Microsoft Teams. Now, if you aren't aware, there is also some basic conditional access that you can implement. Uh, you can do this in the SharePoint Admin Center. So down the bottom there, you should see the option here to select device access. So you, you can control whether devices that aren't compliant or joined to a domain can connect to your environment, whether you want to block them. And the other option that you also have is the ability uh, to actually specify by IP, uh, IP address location. So if you want to restrict users to only work, for example, in their office behind a static IP, you can go into SharePoint, you can put that IP address into there and that will then prevent them from accessing it outside that environment. But again, be very careful with this. It's a very uh, broad weapon here. There are better ways to achieve this with uh, Microsoft 365, but if you want to, certainly out of the box with uh, Office 365, you can do this uh, today. So the place that you need to start when you're thinking about security for Office 365 and Microsoft 365 is the Security and Compliance Centre. So if you haven't been to the Security and Compliance Centre, it will look something like this. So down the left-hand side, we have things like alerts, DLP, data loss prevention, threat management, 
search investigation. So it's its dedicated console for security and compliance. And the features and functionality will vary depending on the license that you have in your environment. Now, inside the Security and Compliance Center, the first place I would suggest you go and have a look at, if you haven't already, is Microsoft Secure Score. So what Secure Score does for you, it will look across your tenant and give your tenant a rating based on the enablement of the security features in that tenant. And it will then provide a score. You can see a score analyzer up the top there that allow you to view that and examine that uh, over a period of time. Now, when you look at uh, Secure score, you will notice that on the right hand side, we're also given a comparison to what our current score is, as well as tenants of the similar size plus the overall Office 365 uh, score. Now, as you can see, the overall average Office 365 average score is only 31. All right, so my suggestion to you would be is to set a benchmark level for your tenants or your customers' tenants and say, look, we're going to make sure that all tenants we implement have a minimum of 150 or 200 or whatever. And these are the steps that we need to implement to make sure that they are secure. We can then demonstrate to our customers that we're taking security seriously by showing them how much more or how much above the average um, the environment that we have configured is. So at the moment, as you can see, a lot of tenants which come out of the box have the standard settings that no one has changed or configured or up updated and that generally equates to a very low score when it comes to uh, this uh, evaluation with secure score. Now the second thing I would recommend in the uh, compliance center that you go and have a look at is go and turn on the audit logging. So the audit logging generally is an on by default you should go on go in and turn that on it takes about 24 hours I think to activate once you've turned it on. That will then allow you to go in and run searches, uh, audit searches through your environment. So in this case, I'm doing a search for a user who's signed into Teams. You'll see that I run that search between the two days. It will then give me the results uh, from the audit logs. I can filter the results and I can export those results also to a CSV file so I can import them into Excel or potentially throw them into Power BI to get even more reporting uh, around that environment. So. If you haven't gone in and turned on your audit logs, please, I would strongly suggest you do. And I would also suggest that you go in and have a play with it and just understand and see how the audit logging does work and the detail that it does go down to. And that's across all Office 365 environments. Now, another thing here is that you can set up with uh, all your tenants is what's called a retention policy. So the way Office 365 is working to retain information is by labeling. So what you do is you go in and classify your data or create a label. Maybe in this case, we're creating a policy to retain data for seven years. See in the settings for this policy, I determine how long the data is kept, uh, when from the point it was created, uh, do I delete it at the end of this period? Uh, how do I handle that? Okay, And you'll see there are advanced options you can go in here. Now, the way that retained data based on these policies is actually handled depends on the licenses that you have. But again, with Microsoft 365, we've got data loss prevention, we've got uh, unlimited inboxes, we've got legal holds. So all of these policies are gonna allow us to quickly and easily retain data for emails, files, and so on. So the way to manage the retention of data these days is again, to use labels and have policies underneath those labels that you can then apply to different locations in your environment. And that means that once the policy is set, the information in there will follow um, those guidelines rather than you having to worry about it individually. Now, one of the add-ons we get with Microsoft 365, and I would suggest a standard add-on that should be added to any tenant is the Advanced Threat Protection or ATP. When we add ATP and we look at the threat management component of our compliance area in Office 365, we will see three new options here, um, ATP anti-phishing, safe attachments and safe links. So the anti-phishing will provide additional uh, machine learning and intelligence over the interactions between users uh, and their emails, so into Office emails. So this is looking to prevent the situation where an attacker manages to get the user's credentials, then sends the pay person an uh, email requesting a major payment that gets approved and so on, and they end up 
uh, basically uh, scamming money uh, out of the business. So that's what anti phishing will do. So Safe attachments again is a sandboxed environment. They'll open attachments and then uh, take an action on them, whether you want them passed through, quarantined, um, or blocked. And the last one is safe link. So if a user clicks on a link uh, that isn't safe, they'll get a, a warning message via a proxy that Microsoft set up to prevent users from clicking on suspect links. Now, the other thing you'll notice here, which again, the bottom three are standard part of Office 365 and all uh, Microsoft 365 as well, that has a standard anti-spam. Again, out of the box, remember that Microsoft 365's tenant, it has only the default settings. So I certainly encourage you to go and look at configuring the anti-spam environment to suit your needs and screw it down and make it a bit tighter. I would also suggest if you haven't looked at things like DKIM and DMARC, which are two uh, emailing protocol technologies, Technologies that will again reduce the spam and uh, false positives as well. And again, we've got the same idea here with the anti malware. So, all of these plus the ATP options are available to us in our Microsoft 365 environment and certainly should be used and configured as appropriately. So, as I mentioned, the ATP safe links, you've got an example here on the screen. When a user clicks on a link that is malicious, they'll be taken to a warning screen telling them this. And you can, as an administrator, can determine whether they're allowed to click through this or whether they're not. The idea here is, is we've got intelligence in the back end looking at this and, and making sure as best they can that the links uh, don't lead to malicious or efficient sites. Now, on top of that, in our emails, we've also got the ability to prevent information from leaking outside the organisation. We do this with DLP policies, which we'll talk about shortly. That will allow you to scan email content, file content for uh, critical information like tax file numbers, and then pop up warnings, take actions, prevent things from being sent outside the organisation. You can determine that uh, by the policy that you set. So data loss prevention is an outbound scanning technology looking for critical information that you don't want to necessarily share outside the organisation. We've also got BitLocker enforcement. So again, we're going to be able to enforce our in encryption at rest on our devices, so if the device gets stolen, uh, it's fully encrypted and again, uh, not much use to someone who has taken it. And we also get the ability to manage all of this sort of software, Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint on our devices, iOS and Android, and we do this uh, through our uh, full version of Intune that comes with our Office Microsoft 365. Now, we can set up things like requiring a PIN number or a fingerprint when users access their corporate apps. So Outlook, if the Outlook app hasn't been accessed for, say, 30 minutes, uh, they're required to put in a PIN number or verify their thumbprint uh, on the device. You can also remotely wipe the device. If the user loses the device, you can initiate a remote wipe so that either all the corporate information is erased or the device is factory reset. So again, You've got this flexibility to do it in an emergency, but also do it if a user does uh, leave the organisation. We can also choose to have encrypted emails and also using the Azure Information Protection, prevent users from forwarding emails that they are sent. So our information protection will protect the content of the email and allow people to only maybe view and print it, but they can't forward it on to other people as an example. So all of these policies are generally set using something like Intune. Now, retaining and archiving our email is probably the most important thing for most people. So thanks to Microsoft 365, we're now going to have the ability to do an in-place archive so users can now keep that information in the cloud. We can have uh, basically our governance over the top. We can set our policies, how long users uh, retain information in their inbox, how long it's kept, uh, maybe it's expired after seven years, and whether we want to hold that information. So hold means that if I put a hold on a mailbox, it means that any changes that the user make, make um, are not relevant or the, the, for the user sees them, the user continues on, but in the background, every change is ordered, tracked, and you're able to recover at any point in time. So the most uh, common situation for legal hold is if you have a disgruntled employee, the last thing they generally do is, is shift delete all their emails. When you have that email box on hold, uh, that means you can recover all of those using eDiscovery. So eDiscovery gives us the ability to search through current content as well as deleted content to find uh, information and present that and potentially export that to third parties uh, like lawyers as well if required. 
So let's talk quickly about data loss prevention. So DLP, you'll see that you can create DLP policies inside Office 365 and Microsoft 365. Uh, these will, for example, scan for credit cards, Australian financial data, driver's license, tax file number, and so on. And they can be then applied across uh, an area within uh, your environment, whether it's a specific, specific team site, specific email boxes, or whatever. DLP also allows us to do document fingerprinting. You can upload a document into the DLP fingerprinting area. And basically what that means is if a user sends a document that looks like the one that's fingerprinted, they will then be uh, subject to that policy. And that may, for example, prevent them sending invoices or maybe uh, things like medical reports outside the organisation. So we can look for specific numbers, but we can also look for document matches and prevent those from leaving the organisation. As I mentioned, we're able to use uh, Azure Information Protection, which is now part of Microsoft 365, to encrypt the data. The actual file is encrypted using AIP. We can determine what users uh, can do with that file outside the organisation. We can also track actions on that document. So what that means is, is that when a document is created, whether it's in Office 365 box or Salesforce or whatever, we can detect the data type. We can then determine and apply a label that sensitive information, that then protects our document, then no matter where it's sent uh, outside the organisation, it's monitored and we can also report and take actions after the event. So if I, for example, sent out uh, a quote to people and one of the people that I sent it to won the quote, I, I can rescind access to everybody except the one person that won the quote. So that's the control that Azure Information Protection and Rights Manager is going to be able to uh, give me. All right, so let's push the down arrow. Let's see what's happening. Okay, so in essence, basically, it means that you can determine who the recipient is, the expiry, because an expiry date, determine whether you want notifications and what permissions the user has. So the user who it's destined for can read it, open it, and work with it. But if they forward it on to somebody else, that user is prevented from accessing the information because the permissions and the rights are inside the document. So mobile device management quickly allows us to manage not only the device, the physical device, which we do with Intune, but we're also going to be able to manage the software inside it. We do that with a combination of Intune um, and our Azure rights management. So we can now fully manage our devices, the hardware and the software. And we can do things like uh, basically allowing users to have some control over that using a company portal, an Intune company portal and they can manage the apps that we select. So Word, Excel, PowerPoint are considered corporate apps that we can manage and prevent information being sent outside that. So they couldn't, for example, forward a corporate email out to something like their Gmail. So it prevent them from copying and pasting from Excel or Word or whatever to their Gmail and then sending that out to somewhere else. So again, that's the level that you can get to when you're using something like Intune to now control and manage uh, the software and the hardware on these devices. So when a user buys a device or enrolls a device, they go through a certain uh, number of steps here, which you can have a look at. But basically, firstly, the device is insured that it is compliant. Maybe it's you don't want it to be jailbroken. And once it is compliant, it's joined to Azure AD. And then what happens is, is the policies that you set around that device uh, are then pushed to the device. So you may set a policy in Intune to require users to only save corporate information into their OneDrive. So they can't save information created uh, for a corporate environment into uh, their, on the, their local device. They'd have to save it up into uh, Office 365. So you can determine and control all that. Microsoft 365, as I mentioned, has legal hold and also e-discovery built into it now. So that means that you can put on hold information so that no matter, even if it changes, the user changes after the fact, You'll also be always be able to recover the original information. You can control how the use, uh, how it's deleted, when it's deleted, and of course you can search across all your information quickly and easily from the security and compliance area, whether e-discovery or content search. So if you're looking for a particular email, a particular conversation from Skype, or a particular file, you can do that in the uh, security and compliance centre. Now, as I mentioned, it is possible to do basic uh, conditional access on devices and with uh, Office 365, but Microsoft 365 and things like Intune and Azure AD Premium give you this ability thanks to Azure. So what you can do in here is you can go in here and be far more granular about 
who has access, what apps can work. So you may say that uh, this app, for example, uh, can be used uh, inside the organization, but it can't be used out on the road. Now, all the other apps may work, so you can set conditional access potentially down to individual locations and individual applications as well. So this is the level you can do, and this is the control that you can get from a single provider like Microsoft now that we've got stuff like Intune and Azure AD uh, in the background working to help us to provide better security. Now, the last thing that I'll mention here is, that in my opinion, there is nothing more important to an IT pro going forward than to know PowerShell. You certainly don't need to be an expert, you don't need to be a coding guru, but you certainly need to be comfortable using PowerShell in Azure and Office 365, because the quickest and easiest way to set these policies and configure it is to use PowerShell. In my example, I have a number of uh, standard scripts that I run when uh, tenants are spun up or when I spin up ten uh, test tenants, that ensures that I turn on the security I want, I turn off the stuff that I don't want, and I've got a secure environment to start with. So if you haven't spent time, if you haven't built up this library of scripts um, to configure devices, to configure your environment, you really need to invest in that because once you get the script right, it's repeatable and it doesn't require someone to sit there and click through the interface and turn things on and off. So I cannot, uh, reinforced strongly enough that all of this at the back end really requires and to get the most out of it and to do it in the fastest, quickest, cheapest possible way is to use PowerShell. So become comfortable with PowerShell to uh, reduce the time for deployment here. All right, I think there are some resources. Like I said, you'll get those slides after. You can have a look at that. And I think with that, I am now pretty much done and I'll hand back over to Arun to continue on. Great, thank you Rob for that great presentation. What I'll do is in the interest of time, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I'll quickly go through the content, really a introduction to uh, the Ingram Micro Cloud Marketplace. Obviously Rob's talked about a lot of products today that relate to the Microsoft 365 uh, sweet. I'm just going to quickly show you where you actually go and order those and uh, also, as I mentioned at the beginning we'll follow up with uh, any individual questions after the session. Okay so uh, basically the, the marketplace it's your one-stop shop for ordering, ordering, provision, managing and invoicing your customers on a single platform. Uh, obviously relates to our cloud services providers around um, CSP. In there, of course, we include uh, the infrastructure, cloud management, our uh, business applications, uh, security, and collaboration all fits within the platform. And also the hero product here is, of course, uh, Microsoft 365. Uh, we also then have three layers. We move from the right to left. Cust your customers can actually, uh, through the marketplace, place orders which come into the reseller control panel. So customers can actually go in and create uh, their own services and resources, uh, which then comes into your view under the reseller control panel. As a reseller, of course, you can view all the customer orders, uh, generate any reports, invoicing, and all those components that sit within that pillar. Uh, when you're actually provisioning uh, services for your customer on the cloud marketplace, Move over to the left, that's when you fire the instance to do the provisioning. You, you can select the service, you can nominate the end client, uh, obviously as part of that setup, and that allows you to uh, go and select additional products for obviously that upsell component, and it also allows you to accept our terms and conditions by using the marketplace to begin with. Uh, it's just a quick look at what the marketplace looks like for those of you that haven't seen it before. Microsoft 365 comes under our business applications area on the left there, and you'll see with the red arrow, we've marked there Microsoft 365. From there, uh, you go into the uh, marketplace, which is au.cloud.im. You mark in there and you log in as yourself. If you don't have uh, those active details, feel free to come on to myself or one of the team and cloud sales team and we'll be happily uh, help sort out discussion and get you onto the marketplace. From there you go and select the products which you're after. Um, if you are registered with us and you have a user ID and credentials, you'll be able to go and log in and see pricing. The examples we're given there are Microsoft 365, the monthly billing option, and also the annual billing option uh, with there. 
From there, you go into the upgrade. You click I agree to the standard terms and conditions. And also you can read through uh, the, the content there it relates, refers to uh, the Active Directory and the license rights requirements. And then from there, you, you'll go see more detail about uh, what, what's included in Microsoft 365 in that display screen, and also the conditions that apply uh, based around that. From there, you'll be able to go and select the individual SKUs or products that you'd like to order. The example we've got there is again Microsoft 365 Business. We've included there the option of the core product at $22.70. Uh, and from there, you can then add on any additional services that you may want on, on top of that base product. So it could be, for example, Exchange Online, uh, Microsoft Analytics, or for example, Threat Protection Intelligence, which uh, I think covered just before. Then from there, once you pick the products that you're looking for, in this case, we've gone for the base product and also the online advanced threat protection. We've gone for one user of each. You would then check the quantity and the pricing. You'll see there MSRP, uh, which is obviously the retail price. And to the right of there, you'll see uh, the reseller price. And then you click on proceed to the checkout. Uh, you'd identify then typically it's a new user, a new customer uh, that you're actually setting up these services for. And you just enter their details in here, including the uh, uh, username, password, uh, the business name, first name, contact details, email address, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then from there, we will then identify that we're looking for uh, the monthly SKU, and it's for basic email. And then from there, you'll actually then place the order. Uh, if you wanted to make, uh, after you've done your first order, if you want to just check in the control panel, you'll be able to go into the billing section there, which is marked in the left. And then from there, you'll be able to see the order. And from there, you'll be able to identify all orders that you've placed for that particular client and identify the details of each of those orders. Uh, for example, there uh, sales order 001, you'll be able to click on there and you see also the defined details that relate to that specific order. For more information on Ingram Micro and our uh, database there, you can go into our service deck, uh, service desk.cloud, Ingram Micro stroke knowledge base or KB for short, and that will provide you a lot more information about how you actually place your orders and um, obviously any help that you need actually to do that. Um, Ask Anything Cloud, we always like to help our customers. So we always have events that run on a regular basis. I've included there the link to these. As Rob has already highlighted, we will include the slides at the end for you. So you'll be able to look at these in a lot more detail later. And you can also learn more about uh, Microsoft 365 on the uh, link that's included there on that page. Uh, we also have the Microsoft Cloud Zone, which is an Ingram Micro Special. In there, it talks about our Cloud Zone, where you can get further information around how you go ahead around upgrading, uh, protecting, and collaborating with Microsoft 365 and uh, some of the other products that sit within that. And we also have a Business Pro offer at the moment for Microsoft 365 Business. Get an extra $60 per seat. So that's for every Microsoft 365 Business subscription you'll receive a $60 cash incentive and buy from Ingram Micro and get your first 30 days for free. So a pretty compelling offer, obviously for anybody now, we are coming to the end of financial year, it's a great opportunity uh, to bring on your first customer and take advantage of this particular promotion. Again, this will be included on the slides that you receive that from it. Also, we have uh, online materials for you to get across uh, self-paced learning as well. We've got the Cloud Elevate On Demand series there, which are free modules uh, to help get you across the detail and also get a lot more comfortable around the product in addition to what you've heard from Rob today. Uh, marketplace support, so obviously support is always important. With Ingram Micro Cloud, you do have 24 by seven coverage. The telephone number there to contact our support team directly is 1-800-464-519. You can also go in, into our knowledge base there, and if you've got a particular question or query, you can just type in that search field at the top, and that will bring up a number of knowledge base articles that you can search through at your leisure. And quite often, the scenario that you're looking for would have come up previously, and we would have created one of those knowledge base documents or articles you need to go in and reference uh, that particular issue that you may have, or if there's a particular knowledge gap you're trying to address uh, whilst on the marketplace. 
If you prefer, you can uh, also email us uh, uh, the Ingram Micro Cloud Service Desk at cloud.im. That's uh, again man managed uh, 24 by 7. So uh, if you need any help from the marketplace team there, uh, we're very happy to do support you. Also, if you have any questions about any of the products or you're looking for additional support from myself or any of the team, you can contact our team in Australia here, dedicated to the cloud sales team. Uh, you'll see the email address there, or you can call us directly on 02 9381 6735. Of course, if you'd like to see more information about the promotions and offers we have on the marketplace, you can just go onto our website, which is Ingram Micro Cloud com.au includes all of our promotions and uh, current material that relates to a lot of the content you've heard today. That's it from me. Um, I think we're right on, on the hour. So uh, as I mentioned at the end, we will uh, come back to the individual that will any questions in the chat function. And uh, we thank you for joining us today uh, with myself and Rob Crane for, uh, from Ingram Micro. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.